Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream. It's April the 16th. Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. It's great to have you on tonight. And a uh, very important conversation this evening about property and economics and politics and how it all intersects in Australia. Uh, Leith, of course, will be in in just a second. Just before I bring him in, let me, as normal, remind you that, of course, we don't provide specific legal or financial advice. It's a general conversation only. We moderate the chat, but do encourage you to throw in questions and comments as you go through. I won't necessarily follow all of the threads there, but uh, if you want to throw a question to Leith or myself, use that Walk the World. That'll get into my separate queue, so it gets my attention. And I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your questions top of the list or indeed make a contribution to what we do around here. We really appreciate those who actually help us uh, to cover the cost of what we do. Don't do this for profit. We do this because we think it's a really important conversation to be had. And now let me bring Leith straight in. Hi, Leith. How are you going? Good day, Martin. Hi. Good day, everyone. Thanks for having me on again. It's really good to have you have you back on, and uh, this is a really important conversation. I, th I I feel that the stars are aligning uh, around some of the critical issues, and uh, you know migration, as we'll touch on, is is one of those really critical issues. But I thought it might be good rather than start from sort of Australia and work out, we might sort of stand back and just look at New Zealand and maybe Canada briefly from a case study perspective, because. In a way, you can almost see how what's playing out in Australia is also playing out over there, and they've actually started to make some rather interesting decisions. Yeah, that's right. Look, so um, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to bring up the charts there, there, Martin, but um, yep, Australia, just tell me Canada. When. Oh, now if you can, that'd be great. Um, yep, just so Australia, Canada, New Zealand are basically you know going for the same sort of growth model. So we're all uh, all all, th all three countries are running huge immigration programs, really high population growth. That's shown in this uh, the chart on the top left there. This, that's by Justin Farber at Antipodean and Macro, and he's actually plotted our population growth, which was two and a half percent in the year of September, which was our highest growth uh, in percentage terms since 1952. We're actually behind Canada, which is at three point two percent, and New Zealand, which I think is about two point nine percent. So, but regardless all three nations are running really huge migration programs and they're basically having very similar results. So New Zealand in some ways is arguably the worst in that it's having both a technical recession, which is the uh, bottom left chart there, as well as a really deep per capita recession. So the overall economy in New Zealand, despite the fact that the, the uh, population is growing by 2.9% um, in with population growth is actually falling in aggregate GDP terms and in per capita terms, it's falling by more than 3%. And the chart there in the top middle comes from uh, Cameron Murray at Fresh Economic Thinking, and he's actually plotted the uh, per capita GDP and the real gross disposable income change in New Zealand. You can see it's an absolute disaster. And basically for five consecutive quarters, they've had, had really hefty per capita falls. And all the data that's come out well, you know, recently has actually been really poor for New Zealand. So. Uh, the the middle bottom chart there comes from Justin Fardo again, and he, and he tracked, this came out uh, earlier this week. It was basically um, domestic spending uh, using, you know, electronic payment methods, which is, let's face it, that's 90% of it at least. And what it showed is that overall spending in New Zealand was dead flat for basically a whole year. But once you obviously, that's in nominal terms, once you account for inflation and then you account for population growth, it's absolutely collapsed in per capita terms. And the top right chart there came out today that's the uh, composite pmi uh, which is like a you know it's a survey measure of uh, activity across new zealand and that's tanking and justin farbo has plotted that against new zealand gdp and as you as you, you can see it shows that you know it's pretty likely the recession's actually gotten worse in the march quarter once that data comes out and finally the bottom right uh, corner shows the um the seek um the seek job ads and also the number of applicants per job ads in New Zealand and the number of the job ads has collapsed to just below pre-pandemic levels. But the bigger thing is because there's massive population growth, they've had an absolutely extreme rise in the number of applicants per job, which is actually well above the peak of where it was during the pandemic. And although the New Zealand's unemployment rate is only four percent, similar to Australia, that they you know it doesn't reflect reality. And all it tells you is that New Zealand's in a really deep economic hole, especially once you strip out that population growth. Yet, uh, most bank economists are tipping that the Reserve Bank in New Zealand is not going to cut rates for a long, well, for, you know, 
at best very late this year and at worst next year. So Westpac tipped that it won't cut till early next year, whereas uh, ASB, which is the base of the CBA of New Zealand, um, tipped that it won't cut till November this year. So you've got the Reserve Bank of New Zealand grappling basically with, you know, sort of stubbornly high services inflation, but at the same time, and, and, and that inflation data, I think, comes out tomorrow, Wednesday, or if not Thursday, but also a really recessionary economy that's really only sort of being kept together by this extreme population growth to sort of paper over all the cracks. And it's a very similar story in, in, in Canada. Now, uh, I've got some charts on Canada, uh, more related to housing. Uh, I didn't bother putting their unemployment charts, but you'll have to take my word for it. Um, Canada, if you think New Zealand and Australia's immigration is mad, Canada's in, Canada had uh, just over 1.2 net overseas, million net overseas migration, uh, migrants last calendar year. And for a population increase of just under 1.3 million in total, and what that what that's done is it's created similar to Australia an absolutely unbelievable rental crisis over there. So I've got four charts here that come from the National Bank of Canada. The top left plots um, their CPI rents, uh, which is their you know rental inflation that's measured as part of the CPI against their population growth. Um, the bottom left has the vacancy rate versus the rents. You can see vacancy rates have absolutely collapsed. Um, National Bank believes it's going to, you know, halve from where it is at the moment. And um, in concert with soaring rents, the top right plots population growth against housing starts and absolutely ginormous housing shortages have been created. And the bottom right has housing, the housing supply deficit as measured by the National Bank of Canada, which is just off the charts almost. And what I didn't include here was that, um, like Australia, Canada's overall economy is growing still. So GDP is still rising because it's got 3.2% population growth. But in per capita terms, it's falling very hard. And Canada, unlike Australia and New Zealand, is, uh, its unemployment rate has absolutely shot up. So it's, it's shot up from about 5% about six months ago to, to about 6% now. So, um, you know, Canada's unemployment rate is shot up. I think it's a bit of a harbinger for Australia. Uh, the upside for Canada, though, is Canada's inflation is plummeting and it's almost back to within the reserve, the uh, Bank of Canada's target. So I think Canada is going to be the first to cut rates, um, you know, across the sort of Anglo-developed nations, Martin. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, New Zealand and Canada have their rates currently higher than Australia. Um, and yet they've still got the same thing. And the reason I wanted to do this was because you know, we might think that uh, Australia is in a, in a unique situation, but the same levers were pulled in these other countries too, which was basically to try and keep the GDP up um, by bringing more people in and, you know, grinding the machine. Uh, the actual employment data is suspect in all of these countries too because of the methodologies that are used. And, um, you know, same in the UK, by the way, the data came out today and showed that there were more people out of the system in the UK than everybody expected. So the unemployment rate um, is still not looking too bad, but it's not really reflecting reality. No, um, it's not. And, and, and uh, that, that's probably a really good segue to go to the Australian unemployment data, if that's all right. Yeah, too. Um, so if you yeah, if you share the screen again, I've got, I've got it ready. So as we know, we had this bizarre, caught every economist with their pants down, basically, uh, myself included. Um, the ABS February labour force data showed that Australia's unemployment rate miraculously <laughs> fell by four by zero point four percentage points to three point seven percent. It and over a hundred thousand jobs were somehow magically created. Now that is the biggest load of number wing I've ever seen in my time doing this. And it basically conflicts with just about every other, you know, data set out there on which monitors this the the Australian labor market. So I've included some charts here, some key charts. Um, the first one on the top left is from Seek. And that basically shows the, the job ads have fallen to around the pre-pandemic level. But more importantly, like New Zealand, because we've had this really strong population growth and got super strong labour supply, um, the number of applicants per job ad is now running about 60% above pre-pandemic levels. So we've got roughly 60% more people applying for jobs. Um, just under that bottom left-hand corner, I've plotted the the official unemployment rate against the applicant applications per job ads. As you can see, the correlation is completely broken down, which sort of tells you the, the ABS figures, a bit of number wing. The middle, the upper middle chart comes from CBA. And 
I actually, in a lot of ways, I actually prefer CBA's data to the ABS. So, so what they do is they actually look at the data from people using CBA bank accounts. So that's basically uh, at least a quarter of Australians use CBA as their bank. So they've got an absolutely unbelievable sample of the Australian economy. And what they've done is they've actually plot the, plotted the employment growth in green uh, as measured by the ABS against the number of salary payments in the CBA bank accounts. And what, as, as you can see, they're just... Um, historically, it's been very highly correlated, but it's just broken down. That relationship's broken down. And the uh, far right chart there I've just showed, just plotted, this comes from uh, Justin Farbo again. Oh, sorry, from Macquarie Bank. And that and that shows uh, all the various, you know, measures of job ads, and they've all fallen. And the, the center bottom chart shows that we need to create about 35,000 jobs a month just to keep the unemployment rate stable. So given this really high immigration we've got, super, and not just immigration, also Costello's, Peter Costello's baby bonus kids are now hitting working age. So that's also boosting the labour force. We need to create about 35,000 jobs a month just to soak up, just to keep the unemployment rate constant, assuming a constant participation rate. And, you know, according to the official unemployment rate, we're doing that. But based on all these other measures, we're not. And I think the ABS uh, labour force survey is going to catch up with these other measures and the broader economy over the months ahead, whether it happens this week when the data comes out, who knows? Cause it's a bit of a, you know, it's a lottery, but I think, you know, it has to, it has to reflect reality at some point in the next few months. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but at the moment, the unemployment data across, across a lot of countries seems to be out of whack. And I think it's cause it's not, it's not accounting for this really strong record net overseas migration across all these countries. And I don't think the surveys are built to, you know, capture that properly. Yeah, absolutely. And Cookie Boy asked a question which is quite relevant. You know, we're talking about New Zealand at the time. Um, if New Zealand is in recession, why hasn't it dropped rates? Can't be just because of inflation. Yeah, well, I mean, it really is just, I think the RBNZ has been really, really cautious. So they just want to make sure that the, um, you know, the, the, they've broken the back of inflation first. Um, I personally think it probably should be cutting pretty soon based on the way the economy is going. It's absolutely woeful. And for, for that matter, too, I think the Bank of Canada should be cutting pretty soon because Canada looks even worse. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, look, I think they've just been, I think because a lot of the banks were caught out over the pandemic, they're just trying to be, you know, they've just been ultra cautious, even though you, the RBNZ was the first to hike. So they were the first to do it. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure why they'd be the last to exit, which could be the case, or, or you know, one of the last. To exit so we'll have to wait and see and, and the other thing is new zealand actually does have quite a lot of pass through uh with their um i think i've got it here with their monetary policy so uh i've just shared some more charts here that basically shows that australia has the most sensitive households in the country to interest rates because we've got the highest share of or one of the high yeah you know, not including south africa and chile but out of the uh, developed countries we've basically got the highest developed country share of variable rate mortgages and also obviously carrying really high debt. But um, what these charts show you is that Australia is actually operating the most restrictive monetary policy in the world. Um, or, you know, one of the most restrictive in the world, despite the fact we haven't raised the cash rate as much as most other countries because we're, our interest rates get passed on so much quicker to Australians than they do elsewhere because we've got so many, so such high variable rate mortgages. We also carry much higher debt loads than most other countries. So that means that we're more sensitive as well. So... Um, that being said, though, New Zealand, if you look at the bottom middle chart there of uh, the rise in um, mortgage rates, New Zealand's had almost a comparable rise to Australia because it hiked earlier and it also does have a fairly high share of um, variable rates or if not variable short-term fixed rates, which most of them are now expired. So um, I think based on that, yes, New Zealand, yeah, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand should be cutting rates you know, fairly soon, soon given the sensitivity and also the fact that their economy is in, you know, such deep water. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because Cookie threw the next logical question, which is, you know, is the Reserve Bank likely to cut this year? And of course, oh, until, so. quite, until quite recently, that was the central thesis that uh, most people were, were running with. Then, of course, we had the uh, most recent uh, outcomes from the US, specifically with much higher inflation 
And so suddenly now it's all all changed a bit. And of course, we've started to get, um, you know, RBA won't cut interest rates until 2025, um, which is kicking it out significantly. So it, it is confusing as to what they will do and what they might do. Of course, they've, they're saying they want to be cautious and careful. But bear in mind that some of the data that they're making decisions off, as we said earlier, looks a bit suspect. Light market. Right? Mm. And bearing yeah, in mind well, the over leverage that we've got in Australia and the high levels of stress that I'm seeing in my data. Um, so you you would say that the chances are this this year rather than next year? Yeah. So so I think I first said it on Sky News about November last year, I said, I think they're going to cut the second half. And I think I was on, I think I was on with Warren uh, Hogan um, and he was like, yeah, what? You know, and they all thought I was crazy. But I was like, no, no, second <laughs> half. Of, but I'm sticking to it. Um, I'm dying on that hill. I mean, not, not, not just to be stubborn, but I honestly think given the data we've got here and this, this whole comparison with the US is a bit silly, I think. So, you know, if you look at the top left chart, so 85% of Australia's mortgages are variable rate, right? And the rest of them are pretty much short term, for very short term fixed rate. So um, compare that to the, to the US where basically 95% of their mortgages are fixed rate mortgages. So what that means is that we have, the, the US hasn't had the pass through of interest rates uh, like we have here. And that's shown on every one of these charts. So, you know, the US has had almost no increase in their debt servicing ratio since they started hiking. New Zealand, uh, sorry, US's outstanding mortgage rates at the bottom uh, centre chart has risen half a percent on average versus, you know, over, nearly three and a half percent in Australia or 3.25 percent in Australia. The, big, the other big difference is the US economy is actually strong. Australia's isn't. So, the right-hand side shows that the charts on the right shows that Australia's household disposable income has collapsed. Right, we've had the biggest collapse in the world in our household disposable income. There's a few reasons for that. It's firstly we've had weaker wage growth than just about everywhere else. Secondly, we've obviously had this pass on of interest rates, which has drained disposable income. Thirdly, we've had massive bracket creep um, in Australia. So you know because. It, uh, the income tax scales, for example, in America are indexed to inflation. They're not indexed to inflation here. So we've had a record rise in income taxes payable. That's also drained disposable income. So Australia's had a huge collapse in disposable income, whereas the US has led the world in, in disposable income growth. So their economy is very different to ours. And finally, the bottom right chart shows that Australia's household consumption has tanked, whereas US has, has risen. So it's, you know, and, and by the way, I should say all these charts, except for the top left one, come from uh, Gareth Dad at CBA. So I should give a hat tip to him. He did some great data on this um, over the weekend or late last week. But, um, you know, all, all, all this tells you is that the Australian economy and the US economy are diametrically opposed. Like they're, it, chalk and cheese. The monetary system's chalk and cheese. The strength of the economy is chalk and cheese. So I think this whole notion that, oh, you know, inflation's rebound in the US, therefore it's going to rebound in Australia and we need to hike interest rates or keep interest rates on hold for longer is not that sensible. But at the same time, you never know. Like, you know, obviously the oil prices spiking, you just had um, uh, Iran, you know, has done the attack on uh, on Israel. So you never know. I mean, there's all these, you know, X factors that could come out and um, et cetera that could scuttle my second half for you. But at the moment, I'm, I'm sticking to it. And I think the labor market data is going to weaken. Uh, it's going to catch up with reality in the next, you know, over the next quarter, say. And then when that happens, I think um, that'll be the, you know, could be one of the key impetuses for the Reserve Bank to to commence an easing cycle in the second half. Probably, if you'd asked me this a few months ago, I would have said probably in the f uh, third quarter. Now, given the number wing and the, in the unemployment data and all the other stuff, maybe fourth quarter. But Second half, I think, still. And one of the questions that follows on from that is the Aussie dollar, right? So um, Leo asked if the RBA cut first, wouldn't that cause the Aussie dollar to drop? And it's worth just reflecting on. Now, the Aussie dollar is currently, um, you know, pretty low, really. Um, it's, you know, down to the um, you know, the 60, 64s, um, 64.18 at the moment. Um, and if they cut, Surely that would also put the exchange rate under pressure. So, um, is the RBA therefore worried potentially about the um, impact on the exchange rate, or is it house prices, which is the other thing that has 
people have been arguing, house prices continuing to go higher has created a problem for the RBA because um, that is again part of the um, you know the matrix. So um, that's I, I would argue the RBA has backed itself in a, a really stupid corner. Um, so almost whichever way they go, they're going to actually break something. Yeah, well, I mean, look, look. At the same time, uh, I don't want to be the defender of the RBA, but <laughs> at the same time, um, they've only got one tool, right? Yeah. So they got interest rates as a tool. They've been put in this corner really by the federal government. You know, if you, if you break it down, it's the federal government that's stuffed energy policies, the fer- which has led to a massive energy inflation. It's the federal government that's basically driven this massive rental inflation and also driven the house price rebound through mm. huge immigration. So, you know, if, if there's anyone to blame on that on that front, it's the, the federal government. Um, it's easy to blame the RBA, but I wish people would blame the federal government more because in, in the end, like the Reserve Bank's got one tool. Which is just interest rates. The reserve, the federal government's got many tools, and in fact, that uh, you'd say it's the federal parliament's full of tools. But uh, uh, you know, most of them blunt. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just just tools, left, right, and centre. But you know, um, it, it, yeah, it has a lot of policy levers. The reserve bank doesn't, and it doesn't. It's not really helping the reserve bank out. If anything, it's making it worse. Yep. Um, like the the migration data that came out today from the Australian Bureau of Statistics was absolutely off the charts. Um, should, should I quickly segue into that? Is yeah, that do. Okay? Perfect. Yep. Yeah, no worries. I'll just quickly tee up the charts. So I've got to skip back. Um, this is all, we always sort of wing this. So uh, I've just put a whole bunch of charts. I don't know what order it's going to be. But anyway, if, if you, can, you can share it now, that'll show it. So as we know, Australia had a record 549,000 net overseas migrants the year to September. That was, you know, the, the highest we've ever had in history by far. Uh, that's shown the chart on the left. Um, and just to put that into context, for the 60 years post the Second World War, we averaged 90,000 dead overseas migration a year. So until 2004, we averaged about 90,000 a year over that 60 years. And then suddenly the federal government, you know, started under John Howard, decided, you know what? The After being lobbied by the business lobby, it said, who said we're facing skill shortage and we need to import a whole bunch of people. It obliged. It ramped up immigration to 220,000 a year for 15 years on average. We had a little dip over the pandemic, and now it's just rocketed to 550,000. The Albanese government's also lifted permanent migration to record levels of uh, nearly 220,000, which you count for you know humanitarians and, and a few other things. And the latest data that's come out in February suggests that the migrations, if anything, has picked up or at least remained at those really high levels. So... The official data is only, only to September. We got some monthly data to February. The um, According to the Department of Home Affairs visa data, we had a record 2.4 million temporary visa holders, if you exclude visitors, in Australia in February. And that's about 400,000 more than we had pre-pandemic. We had a record 713,000 international students in Australia in February. That's about 100,000 more than we had pre-pandemic at the peak. And finally, data that was released today uh, by the by, the ABS on permanent long term arrivals smashed all records on both a monthly, quarterly, and annual basis. So, in the month of February, we had one hundred and five thousand five hundred uh, monthly net arrivals, one hundred and seventy four thousand four hundred quarterly arrivals, and just under five hundred thousand annual arrivals, which are all record highs. So, basically, the Albanese government has delivered us permanent record, sorry, record permanent and record temporary migration. Thanks, Alway, and. That there is the reason why we have a renal crisis. It's as simple as that. There's no other reason. Just than- quick, a quick question, because Albo recently was interviewed, I think, on Brisbane ABC, and he was arguing that all this is is just a, a, you know, a backfill from the COVID years when there was much lower inflation, right? But if you look at those charts you can see that the trajectory is so much stronger, so it's way more than just backfilling. Yeah, look, look, you know, he's just lying, mate. He's a liar. Um, I'll be honest. You know, I, I, I hear this story all the time. Abel Rizvi says it as well. Oh, it's just, you know, catch up and, you know, the population's still smaller than it was forecast in the 2019 budget by the Morrison government, blah, blah, blah. It's just complete garbage. I mean, the reason why it's garbage is that, A, those population projections were way too high anyway in the 2019 budget. But even putting that aside, let's say it's true. It's just catch up. The problem is we haven't caught up on the supply side. So, obviously... 
you know, you can say, oh, the, the population has just come back and, you know, the 2019 budget didn't have a plan for housing either. So, you know, it would have been just as bad under them. That's not true because if the pandemic didn't happen, we wouldn't have had this housing construction collapse that we've yes. had. We wouldn't have had the 40% spike in, building, in, in um, materials costs. We wouldn't have lockdowns that shut down construction sites across the country for months and stopped homes being built. We wouldn't have builders going broke left, right and centre. We wouldn't have as high interest rates as we have now. So this whole notion that, oh, it's just merely catch up and it's not to blame for the housing crisis because, you know, the former government projected the same population in 2019. It's just an absolute cop out and absolute lies by, uh, by you know, our prime minister and, and his cronies. It's just ridiculous. You can't look at one side of the equation and the, the, the you know, the migration flows and not look at the supply side of the equation because the supply side has been smashed. So if you quickly get back all the lost migrants, which is such a stupid term anyway, and you get them back really quickly and you don't have the homes for them because the supply side has been smashed, voila, you have a rental crisis, which is exactly what we've got now. So the guy's just a liar. He's, he's a politician being a politician. Um, you know, all politicians are liars. It's not just Albo, but um, he's just doing a classic, you know, political double speak and lies, to be quite frank. Absolutely. And what's fascinating to me is that there are still industry lobbies, the building and construction industry, amongst others, all arguing for bring more migrants in. And even the Greens Party, who's got this sort of uh, quasi um, government back, you know, social housing strategy, says, no, migration isn't the problem. Um, but to you and I, it looks to me as though migration is absolutely the epicenter of the of the problem that's been created, and of course, just going back to the COVID thing, home builder, of course, and the stimulus programs broke the building and construction sector as well. So you know, yeah. bad policy over many years has got us to this point, and more bad policy, which is to keep that migration high, despite playing lip service to dialing it back and doing all of those things, is is just you know, is BS. And by the way, in New Zealand. And in Canada, now politicians have woken up to the fact that high migration is a problem. That's right. So, uh, so Canada and, and New Zealand. Uh, so the new, it's a bit easier in New Zealand because they've got a new government. So the new Luxon government, the National Party, the Conservative side, has basically come out and said they're going to cut uh, low skilled migration. So, you know, it, it, it's hilarious how under left gov left leaning governments you get the highest migration. So, you know, Jacinda Ardern's government and then the guy who followed Chris. Uh, Hickson or whatever his name is, who, you know, took the reins at the end. Um, you know, they promised lower migration, then they ramped it up to a record high. Uh, Justin Trudeau came in 2015, promised, you know, we're going to have no, we're going to cut down on, we've got too many temporary migrants in Canada and, you know, we need to, we need to have jobs for Canadians. He goes and ramps it to all-time highs, never seen before. And then we've got Albo, comes in and says the same stuff. And then comes and ramps immigration to all time highs. Like, why is it that the left leaning governments always do this? It's kind of strange to me. But anyway, um, you know, that, so the new government in New Zealand has basically come out uh, on, on the weekend and said they're going to cut immigration. Uh, it's unsustainable. Um, the Trudeau, Trudeau government in Canada is now saying it's unsustainable. The, they can't keep up. You know, don't enough housing. Blah blah blah. Um, they're panicking. The problem is though they created the mess. So that's the. Immigration arsonists trying to put out the fire that they created. And now, you know, the Albanese government has kind of dipped its toe in it, saying we're going to halve immigration. They're going to halve it from 550,000 to 250,000, which is still way higher than the pre COVID 15 year average, which was ridiculous, which, which, which was already ridiculously high in historical terms anyway. Um, so, you know, they're all, they're all just a pack of liars, basically. And, and uh, you know, they, they create the problem and then they try and say they're going to fix the problem they created. It's just insane. But it is what it is, Martin. Um, can I just share this one? If you don't mind sharing the, uh, the slides, I just want to get this point because I want to make sure everyone watching this understands this point. So often I read in the media and it just every time I read, I just roll my eyes. They always say, oh, 60% of Australia's population growth comes from immigration. 40% of it comes from natural increase. It's actually incorrect. 100% of Australia's population growth comes from immigration. I'll tell you why, because migrants have children. So this chart on the left, and, and when migrants have children, it gets counted as natural increase. So if you didn't bring them in the first place, you get net, less natural increase. 
So this chart of this chart on the left basically shows the ABS's latest population projections that were released late last year, and they basically they pretty much align up with the uh, intergenerational report. And what it shows is that what I've what I've taken here is I've taken their series um, of zero, you know, assuming zero net overseas migration versus zero uh, versus assuming high net overseas migration, which basically aligns with the intergenerational reports projections, and you can see there that. By 2072, Australia's population would actually be 1 million smaller if we had zero net overseas migration. So all that tells you is that all of Australia's population growth comes from net overseas migration. It comes from immigration. Now, I'm not saying we should do that. I don't think we should have zero, but I just want to make that point because it's it's pretty important. Um, so next time you hear a politician saying, oh, or a media person or you know Shane Wright in the SMH or whatever saying, oh, 60% of Australia's population growth comes from immigration, it's, it's wrong. It's 100%. And... That's the chart to prove it. And on the right-hand side, I've got charts, I've got uh, the ABS's population projections for the major capitals. So the thick green line, the th sorry, the thick black line there is basically was Australia's population in 1950. So by 2071, Sydney's population will be 8.35 million. And that is basically the same as what Australia's entire population was in 1950. I just did it there for re reference because I found it fun interesting. And by 2071, Melbourne's population is going to be nine and a half million, according to this, according to their projections. Brisbane's going to be 4.3 million, um, Perth, 3 million, Adelaide, 2 million. But, you know, once again, the majority of Australia's population growth is going to be in the two major capitals, the two epicenters of net overseas migration, and, and Brisbane's also going to cop it pretty hard. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me. Obviously, this extreme immigration has come up against, as we just mentioned there, collapsing dwelling supply. So Australia, if once you net out demolitions and you actually look at the additions to the housing stock, Australia added only 166,000 homes to the housing stock last calendar year against a population increase of about 660,000 in the year to September. That's the latest official data. So that means we only, had, we only added one home for every new arrival. The problem with it is, the latest uh, trend data on dwelling approvals and commencements from the ABS shows that at an an that we're running at an annualised rate of commencements and approvals of 149,000 dwellings only. So that means that the, the dwelling construction is going to keep falling. And that 149,000 is 91,000 less than the Labor's target of building 240,000 homes a year. So we're not even close. Like all the forward-looking data is disastrous. It's showing that that construction is going to keep falling. And all that means is that the rental vacancy rate, which is shown in the right-hand side from domain, but that I could have used any of the data providers or they'll say the same thing, is already at record lows. It's just going to get worse because so long as they keep running this absolutely extreme immigration into a constipated supply side, we're just going to have more rental tightness. And ongoing high rental inflation, more people being forced to live in group housing, more financial stress, more people being made homeless. It's an absolute inequality disaster. And this whole notion, you know, I always see the Yimby movement and all the usual Muppets trying to say it's a supply issue. Oh, it's a supply issue. It's a supply issue. This is stuff. We all hear it. And they say, oh, Australia just needs to build more homes. Well, well how are we going to do that? So I've created, I've put three uh, data points here. So on the left-hand side, we've got the number of construction workers per capita in Australia is actually way higher than the OECD average. So um, our construction workers per capita is, uh, so basically 5% of Australian uh, workers, or sorry, 5% of Australia's population, 5.2% of Australia's population works in construction. This is all pulled from the OECD. So I got their latest statistics. So Australia's population is actually 27 million currently, but I wanted to use the light at the, the like-for-like like data points from the OECD because they're always like a year or so behind. So that's why it says only 20, 26 million. But um, regardless, Australia's per capita construction workers are much higher than the OECD average of about 3.3%. Uh, the only country that's got slightly higher is New Zealand. Um, the, the percentage of the workforce working in construction was is 9.2%, also at historically high levels. So we've already got massive amount of people working in construction in Australia. Um, so do they? These people think we're going to magic. Obviously, these homes need to be built by people, 
So where are we going to get, get the construction workers from? Are we going to suddenly have, what, 14% of workers working in construction? Well, if we do that, where, where are the nurses going to come from? Where are all the other workers across the economy going to come from? Like, we're going to have to cut back elsewhere, which is going to create problems. So this whole notion that we can just build more homes is ridiculous. And it's also ridiculous because residential construction costs have surged by 30 to 40% over the pandemic, and that's shown on the right-hand side. So, you know, and I should also add that Australian home builders are now competing for labour against the state government big build infrastructure projects. So we've got high interest rates. We've got 30 to 40% increase in construction costs. We've already got one of the highest concentration of workers in the world working in construction. We've got builders going broke left, right, and centre because they can't turn a profit because the costs are so high. How the hell are we going to suddenly magically build more homes and meet Elbow's two, you know, 240,000 homes target? It's just not possible. It's laughable. So the solution, therefore, is we've got to cut immigration because if we don't cut immigration, we're going to have this forever massive gap between housing demand and supply, which just means rent's going to keep rising. We're going to have you know, upward pressure on, uh, on, on, on housing prices. And just on the rental thing, the next time someone says to you, I don't know, you know, immigration doesn't impact the rental market. The rental market was, was, you know, was rising anyway and blah, blah, blah. Just show them these charts. So the charts on the left, uh, quarterly asking rents from SQM Research. I could have used any other data provider, but these, you know, were nicely put together by Justin Farbo and Antipody and Macro. And as you can see, the top left-hand chart there shows the quarterly growth in rents. When immigration turned negative at the start of the pandemic, guess what? Asking rents turned negative. When immigration rebounded and, and surged, asking rents surged. Funny that. One for one correlation. The middle chart, the the, up, the top middle chart was put together by uh, Harry Otley at CBA last week. And it was, it's a brilliant chart, actually. And what it actually shows is that the uh, rental growth is incredibly highly correlated to the change in the population versus apartment construction. So basically, when apartment construction rises versus population growth, rental growth falls, or when population growth rises relative to uh, you know, apartment construction, rents rise. It's shown very clearly there. And just under that, Harry Otley put together the change in rents across capitals versus the change in population growth. Look at that relationship. Anyone who tells you that immigration is not behind the spike in rents and the rental crisis is a bald-faced liar or an idiot. That's all I can tell you. They're an idiot or they're a liar because this data comprehensively shows it. And just on that last point, another reason why rent's going to keep rising, aside from the massive population growth, is if you take that upper middle chart from Harry Otley on the you know rental growth versus apartment construction, well, A, we've got surging population growth, which is bad, but also the bottom right chart there the right-hand side, I've actually plotted apartment approvals, the latest apartment approvals data, high-rise and low-rise. High-rise apartment approvals are down by about 55% from their peak. They're at absolutely appalling levels. That's the blue line. The red line shows low-rise apartments. They're down 80% from peak. So if we've got record population growth at the same time as apartment construction is approvals are absolutely collapsed, pointing to further weakness ahead for apartment construction, what do you think that means for rents? based on that upper middle chart, rents are going to rise and they're going to rise viciously if, if that chart, if that relationship in that chart hold, holds true. So this is an absolute elbow created rental crisis here we've got. He's created this. He deliberately ramped immigration to all time highs. He used the Jobs and Skills Summit as cover. He lifted the permanent intake to all time highs. He loosened a whole bunch of regulations for, you know, for temporary visas like students, et cetera. He signed two migration deals with India to give them easier access to come here. And that is why we have a rental crisis. At the same time as obviously the supply side's constipated as well from all the pandemic stuff. So Albo has literally thrown people on the streets. He's driven up your rents and he's forced people to live in group housing. It is as simple as that. This is an Albo engineered housing crisis that we've got. And it's going to continue until they cut immigration. Simple as that. Yeah, and just to underscore, you know, we often say, um, well, you know, the economics of housing is is a bit broken. But the point is, the economics of housing has been completely overridden by the politics of housing, right? Politics has driven this. This is a series of bad decisions over a good long period of time that's actually led 
to where we where we've got to, and yet, you know, the current incumbent basically is saying nothing to see here. You know, we're going to build some more 1.2 million over five years, which, by the way, they can't never possibly build. Never be done. Um, and in the meantime, the strong migration is bringing more people in. The other interesting observation, uh, I don't know whether you saw some of the coverage at the weekend, but I, I looked in detail at who's buying property because one of the other interesting observations is property prices have continued to rise. You know, Everyone expected they'd fall because interest rates rose. But, of course, a lot of people getting into the property market don't actually need to borrow. So there are people coming from that migration path, bringing cash with them. We've also got people who are getting help from the bank of mum and dad. We've also got people who are downsizing and are using the equity from their property to buy more property. So not only do we have a supply problem with housing relative to migration, but we also have a price lift which continues to drive household wealth, quote unquote, for those in the fortunate position to be able to be on the right side of the fence when it comes to housing. But on the other side of the fence, we've got numbers of people now living in tents, in the tent cities around the place. We've got a lot of people on the streets, a lot of people living in cars, or indeed, um, you know, piled in with other people. So the social consequences of these bad political decisions are being played out in so many different ways. Yeah, and and um, if you don't mind switching across again, Martin, I'll just you know segue on that. Um, you know, th th this record, so I've talked about rents, obviously. Like rent, rent seem to, rents are the area which I'm most concerned about, I'll be quite honest, just because it tends to be lower income people who rent and they're, they're more marginal, marginalised, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the whole price situation stinks as well, but I'm more concerned about the rent the rent situation because that's sort of like the, you know, it's the area where the, where the most vulnerable people live. Um, but, you know, record immigration is also to blame for the recent house price rises. There's no way around it. I mean... The Reserve Bank of Australia's, you know, hiked the cash rate by what four point two five percent, and that's created a thirty percent decline in borrowing capacity thereabouts. Yet we've had house prices hit a record high, and the only reason why they've done that is because of this, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. Like people are, who are on the rental market are just queuing up for properties, they're seeing the rents rocket, etc. They're desperate to buy. Then you got the record migration, obviously buying, etc. So. You know, th th this whole thing is uh, is driving up um, is obviously driving up prices as well. And you know, it's basically ultimately where we're going to get is the death of the Australian dream. So we know that home ownership rates have been falling for decades, and the data is only the twenty twenty one census. So it would have gotten worse, no doubt, in the last couple of years. Um, you know, since we've had this spike in prices, etc. Um, the middle chart here comes from Tarek Brooker. Uh, he's done the uh, the proportion of homes are owned outright. So basically, you know, fewer people are owning homes outright than they used to, especially amongst younger age cohorts. So they're going to be retiring with a lot more debt uh, than previous generations did. And that and that raises questions about the whole sustainability of the retirement system because you're going to have, potentially have a whole bunch of people who are just going to withdraw their super you know, as a lump sum and to use it to pay down the debt and then they won't have any money to live off. And in some ways, the biggest destruction of the Australian dream is shown in the chart on the right. Now, this is just for Sydney, but it's kind of, you know, symbolic of what's happening here. And the, these are projections that come from the Urban Task Force. And what they what they did was they basically grabbed the 2016 census and they projected, this is, yeah, this is a couple of years old, this data. Um, they, they projected how Sydney's housing composition is going to look by 2057. And basically... They projected the city would go from 55% detached homes in 2016 to just 25%, whereas apartments will increase from 30% up to 50% and townhouses will go from 14 to 25. So what that basically means is that if you're a city sider in 2057, only 25% are going to be living in detached houses. And you can guess which 25% that's largely going to be. It's going to be the rich. And, you know, everyone else is going to be, well, all, all, all your, um, you know, uh, poorer people are going to be living in, high-rise Harry's type shoeboxes and a lot of them are going to be renting. And is that really the future you want to bestow on us? Like that is the death of the Australian dream. Well, what happened to having a house in the backyard? It's gone. It's vanishing, especially in Sydney. And Sydney's going to be the worst, obviously, because it's, you know, it's landlocked and the most expensive. But these sorts of trends are going to happen everywhere uh, across the major cities. And is this what we want? Like who the hell wants this? And the only reason why it's happening is because 
the government wants to increase the population to, well, the official projections, 40 and a half million people by 2063, according to the Generation Report. And that there is, you know, that 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 that'll that there's an increase of 13 million on current levels. And that's like adding another city, uh, Melbourne and Brisbane in just f- f- now 39 years from now. It's an unbelievable amount of population growth. And do we really want that? Like, do we really want that? I don't think we do. Well, but that's inter- this interesting. This is what the politicians it- are doing. Interesting, you raise this because um, Dick Smith, who of course has been very much on the um, the big Australia problem for, for many years, was actually uh, reported in the um, the Daily Mail over the weekend, and uh, you know that rags a bit all over the place sometimes. But uh, the article was actually re- quite relevant because basically he said, "Look, you've got to understand that." The settings that we've currently got will mean that youngsters will be forced to live in China-style units, um, that the uh, old idea of a house has pretty much gone, they'll all be replaced by high-rises. And um, basically, he said, you've got to actually deal with the root cause problem, which, guess what? It's population because basically it's population that's creating the the problem. And, uh, you know, so he is another one calling out the destruction of the Australian lifestyle and the destruction of local suburbs. And it's very interesting to me that there's a really big um, battle going on between the top-down view from Canberra, which is, you know, build more stuff, and, of course, the um, the states are being bribed to build more stuff. But then the local councils are saying, well, not in my backyard, you know, we, we and they're actually putting preservation orders on, on, on some... Uh, property close into the centre of some of these locations to try and stop it. And interesting, Chris Mims, a few years ago, back in, I think, 2017, was grizzling about the high-rise destruction of Hurstville, right, (laughs) which is one of the inner-city suburban areas in Sydney that have been really badly impacted by high-rise development. And, of course, now... So so was Max Chandler Mather, you know, the same, (laughs) the the, the Greens guy who... Won't say a bad word about immigration. Says that we can't talk about it. It's got nothing to do with the housing crisis, etc. He was. I wish I had the photo here, but he, um, you know, got a great photo of him with Save Our Suburbs holding up signs like this in his suburbs, saying "No more development, no more, uh, no more townhouses, stuff like that." So he, he he's also a nibby, but then he goes and tells us that we we got to have unlimited immigration because he's an absolute open border zealot. At the same time, complains about the rental market and you know poor renters and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, mate, you're not serious. You're not a serious person. If, 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 if that's what you're doing, you're full of it. You just, you know, he's very, he, look, he's doing smart politics because the renters don't have a voice at the moment and they're going to vote for the Greens because they're at least the only ones who are at least pretending to be on their side, even if they're not really. But, um, you know, so, but it's just a farce. Like we can't, if you can't in- mention the immigration elephant here and what this means if you're a resident of a major city, well, then what are we doing here? Like, I, I think these charts on Sydney, I think this chart on Sydney tells you everything you need to know. Like, we're going to have, you're going to be, your, your, your children and grandchildren are going to be forced to live in high rise dog boxes and probably rent them as well because they won't afford to live, you know, afford to own it. And we all know the quality of those high rise dog boxes haven't been that great. So, you know. According to the uh, New, New South Wales Strata Council, um, you know, like about half of the apartments that have been built, uh, that were built during the boom in the second half of the last decade were have got major faults. So it's like, do we want that? You know, like, do we want to be living in these absolutely terrible Chinese style apartments? I don't think we do. It's not, that's not the Australia I grew up in. No, it's a very different transformation. In fact, already, if you want around some of the, the suburbs that were, you know, a few years ago, quite um, low rise and uh, quite quiet, and now absolutely, um, you know, built to the roofs, to the rafters plus, and, um, you know, high capacity with traffic and everything else, and a general lifestyle, you know, deteriorating quite quickly. And it's quite interesting to me that, um, you know, some of the most significant developments underway at the moment are buy to rent, built sorry, build to rent. Yeah. So this is another whole, you know, Ponzi scheme basically where the construction yep. industry is now corporatizing the housing market. Correct. Yeah. And, and are basically building cheap high rise um 
to rent out. And Cameron Murray, Murray did some interesting analysis to say, well, those are build to rent apartments. More expensive. Yeah, tend to have higher rents and more expensive and uh, aren't really solving the critical issue. So, and yet that's another, you know, th- issue thrown in. And I would argue, again, it's being supporting the large construction sector and the corporatization of, of, of property even more. And, and again, it is just another sign of a, you know, deep, deep problem that we have in the country. Yeah. And, and if you don't mind, just switching back to the slides quickly, um, you know, the just talking on on Max Chandler, Chandler Mather, the Greens guy, his, his solution is I just need to build a whole bunch of public housing, right? Mm. Well, it's like so I'm going to build 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 um, public housing to house migrants, basically, because he wants massive immigration as well. So we're going to build homes for migrants. Effectively, is what he's saying. But look, I get the point that public housing construction has been terrible. So we've got two charts here, which basically plots, um, you know, the provision of public housing across the country, which is in the blue. Uh, against private housing. And you can see, you know, we used to, back in 1955, 22% of all all homes constructed were public housing, and it's about 2% currently, right? So definitely it's fallen, and it's not high enough. The problem with it is this whole notion that we can just build more public housing is kind of moot uh, moot and will cost a lot of money, obviously, but it's kind of a bit of a fool's, fool's gold when you're going to grow the population like a science experiment. So what I've done is I've, I've overlaid the public housing construction against Australia's population change. And you can see they've just gone the complete opposite way. And on the chart on the right, I've done the population increase per new public home. So in 1955, we built one public home per 14 new residents. Currently, it's one public home per 2,020 new residents. That just shows you the scale of of how much public housing we'd need if we keep running this huge immigration program. Like, yeah, we should do we should build more public housing, sure. But it's not going to really solve the problem if you're going to grow Australia by Canberra every year through immigration, is it? Like you, you're just basically putting a band-aid on the problem and it's going to cost a lot of money at that. And then you're going to end up just basically filling it full of migrants anyway. So, you know, I don't know if it actually makes the uh, the incumbent population better off anyway. But that's sort of what the Greens' whole policy is. So we just go and spend billions and billions of taxpayer dollars building public housing, which I'm actually for, but I'm not for it if you're going to then just, you know, keep immigration at extreme levels because they will kind of self defeating What are you doing here? Like, how about you cut the immigration back to, you know, the sort of pre-2005 levels, uh, which worked perfectly for 60 years, get it down to sort of sustainable levels, slow the population growth right back, and then you can build the public housing. And then we might actually eat into the deficit rather than just increasing the deficit, but just not increasing it quite as quickly as you would have if you didn't build these houses, which is the sort of whole solution that the Greens have got here. And, um, you know, yeah, it's just crazy, mate. Uh, the whole housing slash immigration debate now is just, you know, well, well, it's been bonkers for years, but this whole notion that it's just a supply side issue is just, just doesn't pass the laugh test. And I think this data shows it comprehensively. And just on that, um, the other stupidity is why don't we bring more migrants in to become builders to be able to build stuff for more migrants, right? Nobody seems to understand the stupidity of that circularity. Well, I've got a great great chart on that. Great, um, uh, now, I, I, look, if anyone's listening and they can tell me who created this chart, um, someone emailed me a while back and said it was me, but I just lost the email. I don't know who, who created it, but I want to give them credit for it because it's awesome. I got off Twitter and I don't know who did it. But anyway, that, that's the one on the right. So on the left, you know, the the head of the Master Builders Australia, I think it was, or it was the Urban Task Force. Uh, no, it was Master Builders Australia. Last month said, we've got a quick, we've got a pretty 90,000 migrant builders to solve the nation's housing crisis. And I was just like, oh God, here we go again. Okay, so you're going to bring 90,000 builders supposedly, right? Well, we're going to need probably 90,000 homes to house those builders because they'll take their families in as well, right? They're not going to live together, most more than likely. So you're going to need 90,000 homes for that. Then we're going to need hospitals for them because they're going to add to hospital demand. We're going to need teachers because they'll probably have kids. Um, so we'll need to provide teachers. We're going to have to provide road space for them. We have to provide all these, every other service that these 90,000 people create. Now, it reminds me of this diagram that this person created which is just the circularity of the whole thing. 
houses too expensive. We've got to increase supply. We've got to import more migrants to build houses. The houses never get built. Migrants need to live somewhere. House prices go up. Houses are too expensive. And there's just circularity of it. It's crazy. Now, this whole skills shortage, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, guys, I've got, a bit, I've got COVID, by the way, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just battling on. Um, so, so this whole skills shortage thing is just absurd. So I said earlier that, you know, in 2001, the Howard government was lobbied by the business lobby. So we're talking about the Business Council, the Australian Industry Group, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And they, they held a review and they said, look, Australia's suffering from skill shortages. We need to import a whole bunch of migrants to solve those skill shortages. The Howard government obliged and for, you know, the better part of 20 years or this century, we've run a huge immigration program to try and under the guise of skill shortages. But when you, when you step back and you look at it, you go, okay, hang on. So we've imported eight, well, Australia's population has grown by 8.4 million people this century. That's 44%, enormous growth. We've got more university graduates than ever, yet somehow we've got worse skill shortages than ever. How does that work? Does that tell you that maybe, just maybe, it hasn't worked and immigration might actually make the skill shortage even worse? Maybe, because that's what the empirical data says. And yet these Muppets always say that the solution is more immigration. Oh, we've got, we've got, to, got to get more because, you know, that'll solve it, even though it hasn't done it for 20 years. Now, just to put some data around this, we all know that the tip of the spear in the migration system is the international students, right? So they're basically the feeder. So they come over, they, you know, they study as a student, they work while they study, which we think wrongly count as an export, even though they're earning the money here. So that's a whole other story. But, you know, just the way we juke the stats. And then a lot of them then transition to, you know, they, they become, say, they, they go on a graduate visa, they stay here for longer, they become a temporary migrant, and then they hope to become a permanent migrant. And they actually drive our permanent migration system because they start off as an international student, they then transition, blah, blah, blah. Yet, when you actually look at the data, are they really solving skill shortages? So I've got three data points here. So the first one on the left comes, the, comes from the migration review. And what it shows is that 51% of international student graduates who've been in the country for three years and have studied a bachelor degree are working in low-skilled jobs. They're working as couriers, postal delivery workers, cleaners, waiters, baristas, bar attendants. They're supposed to be skilled, but they're doing this, right? Then the Committee of Economic Development Australia released a report last month, huge report, and basically just showed that the skilled migrants that we've got basically aren't working in skilled jobs by and large. So they, they, they found that, um, that you know, so-called educated migrants earn more than 10% less than the Australian-born population. They've also got higher unemployment, right? So it's like, well, that's great. And then we've got the Graduate Outcome Survey, which is the uh, chart on the right. That gets released every year. It's always a couple of years behind. But what it basically shows is that uh, international graduates' employment rates participate patient rates and wages are way worse than the, than local graduates. So, these, so this is Australia's skilled migration system. You bring them over and then, you know, to fill skill shortage, to become skilled workers, they don't actually be workers, skilled workers. They end up driving Ubers or something else. And, you know, probably the biggest example of that is the, the um, engineering sector. So, you know, my father-in-law is an engineer. I talk to him about it all the time. But 60% of Australian engineers are foreign, by, foreign born, right? But half of them, don't even work as engineers. Most of them work in low skill jobs like driving Ubers. And Engineers Australia, um, I don't have, I wish I'd included it here. They, they the, the cover of their uh, their trade magazine, Create, a couple of years ago, had this big thing about the unemployment amongst migrant engineers and how terrible it was. It's like, well, how about you stop bringing them in and you use the ones that you've got here first before you keep importing more? Because that's what we keep doing. We bring them over to work here. It's a bit like with that housing you know, uh, equation. We bring them over to work here as engineers to solve an engineering shortage. And then they don't work as engineers. They work, they drive Uber or something else or do something low skill. That's the, that's Australia's whole migration system. You can do that across everything, whether it's accountants or whatever. Like we have, why do we have so many, why is accounting one of the number one studied courses amongst international students? Why are they coming here to learn the Australian accounting standards unless they want to stay in Australia indefinitely? Oh, aren't they coming here to learn skills and then take them back to the home countries? Well, if you did that, why do you need to know Australian accounting standards? The whole thing's a migration scam. Simple as that. And the thing about it is it's actually destroying Australia's productivity. So 
We've got a chart here, top left-hand corner from Jared Minnick. And there's a, I've got an identical chart for Canada, so uh, which I don't have in this chart pack, but Canada, the National Bank of Canada did the exact same chart for Canada, showed exactly the same thing. And basically what it showed is that, you know, Australia's, one of the reasons why Australia's productivity sucks and why Canada's productivity sucks is because we've got what economists call capital shallowing. So basically we've grown the population through immigration at a far higher rate than we've, than we've grown business investment, we've built infrastructure or we've built housing. And what that's basically done is it's diluted the capital stock amongst more people and then that, that hurts your productivity. And the bottom chart there comes from the Grattan Institute. And, you know, I don't agree with a lot of what the Grattan Institute says, but this is a great chart. And this shows you exactly why immigration, Australia's current immigration system is really bad for the housing market. So not only do we bring in too many people and we've got to build houses for them, we can never do it, but also the overwhelming majority of migrants that we bring in don't work in construction. So the Grattan Institute estimated that 32% of Australian workers were foreign born, but only 24% of workers um, are in building and construction. So only 24% of workers in building construction were overseas. So what it tells you is, and, that, and that's primarily because of the international student channel, right? They don't come over here to do become tradies. They come over here to do a BS course and then they be underemployed. And then they add to housing demand without helping supply. Um, and then they, then they don't plug skill shortages because they don't end up working in their areas and they end up doing other stuff, which means we've always got these perpetual shortages in areas where we actually need people. And the solution to the whole skill shortage farce is to basically reduce the size of the migration intake, make it much smaller, make it better targeted and, and focused on quality. And we've got to basically recalibrate the whole migration system so that it's set at a level that is below the nation's ability to supply homes, to build homes and to build infrastructure. Because at the moment, we've got it the wrong way around. We're bringing in too many people. It's above our capacities to build homes and build infrastructure and business investment. And as a result, we've got that capital shelling, the productivity is getting killed, that wrecks living standards, we then get all the congestion, all the other stuff around it, and we end up going backwards. And just one final point on that, Martin, if you don't mind, Labor has this stupid policy that they announced the last few months, another elbow, elbow disaster in the making, where basically they want to, they've set a 55% university attainment target. So basically around 45% of young Australians currently do a bachelor degree, go to uni. Labor wants to, which, which I'd argue is way too high. We have way too many people doing university degrees. We don't have enough people doing trades and vocational education. So that's where the shortages are. They're real skills. That's where we need people. But Labor, being Labor, wants to increase that to 55%. So they want another 10% of people, young people, to do university now. And they've set targets for it. And all that's going to do, it's going to starve us even more of people doing trades, doing real work. And we're just going to create bigger shortages across areas where we desperately need people and where there's better career prospects. Like why do, you know, one of the worst things this country did and it started on, it happened under John Howard, I believe, is it got rid of trade schools. So there used to be a whole bunch of trade schools near me and, you know, my cousin-in-law did his uh, automotive apprenticeship there. He's been a really successful, uh, you know, um, mechanic, he owns his own business, et cetera. He's like about my age. But all, you know, half of those trade schools, most of them are shut down. And that was done in the 90s. I think it was done by Howard because there was this stupid presumption that we need to send people to university and, the, and that that's where, you know, the better jobs were, et cetera. So voila, you know, 30 years later, we now have shortages across all these areas where we desperately need people. We've got way too many people doing university degrees. Often the, the credentialism is mad whereby customer service roles that you could you could use you used to be able to do straight out of school now require a university degree. Like why? It's pointless. And we're just wasting resources trying to funnel people into university when they should, when a lot of people should really be doing real work and doing trades and stuff. And labor's just going to make this worse. And the whole migration system makes this worse because it's so focused on international students who don't work in these areas that we need them. Yeah, it's interesting. My ex-wife, uh, sorry, ex-wife, uh, late wife, I should say, um, actually was a university professor and she worked in the university sector and uh, basically commented on the degraded value of the degrees that were being taught because oh, the, the university system was essentially on, let's increase the numbers 
but they basically just diluted and diluted and do the quality of the degrees at the end of the process. So, you know, degrees today really are worth a lot less than they were some. And some they're more expensive. Back. Yeah. It's it's also supply. So the qualities, they just turn them into, into, into uh, degree mills. Yep. Where you just go in there, as many people as you can, throughput, 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 maximum revenue for the universities, et cetera. They've dumbed them down to cater for international students. Like, like we need to lift, uh, you know, teaching standards massively, entry standards. They need to get rid of group assignments. Um, they need to be basically, you know, um, tested properly. And if they don't pass the mustard and they can't pass the course, they get sent home. Simple as that. But instead, they pander to them and, you know, put them in group assignments and push them through yep. because that makes the money. And look, you know, it, this whole shortage we've got in trades and areas like that where we actually need people and even engineering. Um, a lot of it comes down to obviously getting rid of trade schools, et cetera, you know, was disastrous, but also privatization has, has helped do, do this as well because, you know, my, my father-in-law is a, uh, he's in his seventies. He's still working as an engineer, but he's going to retire soon, but a really good engineer. And when he finished his degree at Monash university, he went and worked at the gas and fuel corporation in Melbourne. So that used to be, you know, the, the, the publicly owned utility. And they used to have a social contract when it was publicly owned where they'd take in dozens of graduate engineers, they'd train them up, and then they'd do three years, three years stint there, and then they go and go into go into the workforce and they've got real experience. Um, I did the same at the Australian Treasury. So when I went to the Australian Treasury, um, I'd already worked a little bit another job, but I went there and I, you know, worked as an economist, et cetera, and sort of got my some of my skills there. Um, but because we privatized all these utilities now and all these, you know, utilities and all that stuff, which used to be feeders for our graduates to then go in and get proper work experience, get trained. Effectively, it's like a second apprenticeship. And also not just for university students, also for tradies. They could go in and work as, you know, uh, boilers or whatever, boiler makers and fitters and all that sort of stuff. We got rid of all, we, we, we privatized that and private companies don't want to do that work. And we've, we've, we've lost that entire feeder system for university grads, grads and, and also vocational, you know, uh, graduates to get real world training. Um, and because of that, we're robbing ourselves of skills. And, and, and these companies that now privately own these, these things, these uh, utilities, now expect that people just to have all those skills, you know, um, straight up rather than training them. And they, they don't, they're not willing to train anymore. So as a result, the solution is always, oh, we need to get a, like a migrant from overseas because there's no local skills here because they haven't bothered to train the bloody people in those skills. So it's just created this whole vicious cycle we've got now. And it's it's a whole lot of things, shutting down trade schools, the focus on university over vocational education and TAFE, um, privatisation, which has gotten rid of all training programs, et cetera, et cetera. And that is basically the reason why we're in this predicament that we're in. And, you know, I don't know what the solution is. I've thought about it. Maybe... The federal government should heavily subsidise private companies because they've already sold all this stuff off to take to take in and train graduates, uh, you know, graduate engineers, um, apprenticeships, all that sort of stuff. You know, maybe they need to do that because we need to have some feeder system for someone to do a course to come out, get a couple of years of real world experience where they get trained and taught how to do things, and then they can go on and do other stuff. Because if they don't have that bridge. They're never going to have the skills to then go forward, and then these companies are going to say, "Oh, there's no skill. We don't, we've got skill shortage, and you know, there's no suitable applicants in Australia. We've got to grab someone from overseas who's already got a couple of years' work experience." And then they grab that person, they find out they're not that good, and then they end up; those people end up working in underemployed jobs, driving Ubers, etc. Because that's currently the system we've got. It's not working, so change the system. Lower quality, uh, lower volumes, higher quality. That's the way we should do it. Yeah, well, there are levers that could be pulled, but um, you know, I, I am sort of standing back and thinking about the recent announcements from from Albo. You know, you, of course, the most recent one was the manufacturing in Australia strategy, which we might to touch on in a second, right? But when oh, then we had the what a muppet. <laughs> But then we had the um, you know the migration strategy that came out last uh, 
um, oh, was it October, November time, just before Christmas, right? Which was like, well, didn't say anything, but it sounded good, right? Or the 1.2 million homes that we're going to build. Um, we seem to be very good at, at throwing out these sort of, um, you know, well, I call them announceables because basically, you know, it's news that they can talk about, but it doesn't mean anything, right? And, and yeah. I find it's utopia. That, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say. I mean, the- seriously, <laughs> just 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 get Rob Sitch to do it. Like, he, he just put him in government. And and well, actually, Rob Sitch was always a skeptic. The the other guy, uh, uh, Lamo. You know, you know. Did you ever used to watch Utopia? Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Utopia. Yeah. Exactly. We got you got you got the Lamo character. Whoever's oh, you know, we've got a we need we need something big inland rail. Right? You know, this sort of stuff. <laughs> That's basically what we've got in the government at the moment. It is it is like Utopia is a piss take, but this is what we've got. Yep. <laughs> it really is. It's crazy. But anyway. And, and specifically on the manufacturing, <coughs> Australian manufacturing thing, which came out you know, very recently, I know that you were interviewed on Sky about it and you had some pretty strong opinions, which I think um, would probably resonate with many people, which is basically, hang on a moment, are we actually going to subsidise um, industries, particularly manufacturing industries, that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be economic? Yeah. So, so my, my, I, I've got two criticisms about this. So basically... The federal government has got this, uh, what is Australian made, you know, future low emissions manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. Australia's going to start building solar panels or whatever. Um, first of all, we're never going to be, you know, we, we, we gave away that advantage decades ago, unfortunately. Like a few people would know that Australia actually invented solar panels. Like, um, you, you'd remember this, Martin, but, hmm. well, maybe it might have even been before you came to Australia, but back in the 80s, they used to do every year a race up in the Northern Territory where they basically had... Um, they, they'd race these cars yep. across the top end, uh, solar-powered cars. This was like back in the 80s. I remember when I was at school, this used to happen. And Australia was a world leader on that stuff. But unfortunately, we didn't ever commercialise that. China took the IP and they've run with it. Um, they dominate solar panel manufacturing now, really cheap. They can do it cheaper than anyone. Um, Germany's got sort of higher end and uh, Japan, I think, has got a bit as well. But this whole notion that Australia can magically start building solar panels and be competing is uh, – it, it'd be – Cost competitive is just laughable. But my bigger concern, so all we're going to do is we're compelling people to go into renewables and they're going to force up their costs because we're going to basically either force them to buy Australian made or force them to subsidise Australian made. So they're going to pay one way or the other. But the bigger concern I've got, so put that aside to one side, the bigger issue I've got is if Elbo really wants to juice engineering, uh, sorry, juice manufacturing and get manufacturing going, we need cheap energy. And we have created a, a system down here where we are an energy superpower. We've got oodles of the stuff. Uh, I'm not including oil here. I'm talking obviously, you know, um, gas and electricity. But we should have the, some of the cheapest ele- electricity and gas prices in the world because we export all that stuff. But for some stupid reason, we pay orders of magnitude more than, say, the US and other places around the world. And if Albo is so concerned, he wants to really get manufacturing back, we need to be cost competitive. And the easiest way we can be cost competitive is to bring down energy prices. And the way you do that is you reserve gas. So basically, um, Western Australia has a gas reservation policy. And even though Woodside's trying to get their wiggle out of it, but the they, they require that uh, 15% of export gas gets reserved for domestic use. I think at the moment they're only supplying 8% because they're trying to, you know, the, the government needs to strong arm them and get them to make the agreement. But regardless, Western Australia has really low gas and electricity prices because gas sets your marginal price for electricity because it's the it's the key firming power. Um, on the West Coast, on the East Coast here, we don't have a reservation policy. We're literally the only gas exporting jurisdiction in the world that doesn't reserve our gas for domestic use. And as a result, we pay really high gas prices and we pay really high electricity prices as a result. So we've literally stuffed up energy policy in this country. And we've created a situation where manufacturers are stuck paying really high input costs for their power, which is a key component of their cost competitiveness. And if Albo really wants to boost manufacturing, don't do these stupid boondoggle picking winners, you know, announceables, like his, his build Australia thing, give us cheap energy and let the market sort it out. Because I guarantee you, when you do that, we might actually get some manufacturing because we might actually become cost competitive. But as long as we keep driving up the cost of electricity and gas through the roof, through stupid policy, mostly pertaining to the gas market, 
we're going to have this problem. And, and it's just, it's absurd. Like we export about 80% of East Coast gas. Most of it goes to China, who then uses our gas to create uh, solar cells, et cetera, which they then sell back to us. It's insane. They use our subsidized cheap gas to make themselves competitive, but we don't use our own cheap gas to make us competitive. We still we, we instead give it away and then drive up our domestic costs to basically pay the world price. And the situation has gotten so absurd that one of the solutions to our high gas prices now is to build import terminals so that we can import gas, even though we've got tons of it over there, then degasify it, sorry, deliquefy it back into vapor to then use instead of just, it's in, it's in the ground over there. How about we just not send it to Gladstone? We don't freeze it and lose, you know, eight percent of our gas when we freeze it because it's very energy intensive. Sell it overseas and then go and import some other gas. It's just it's moronic. Can you imagine Saudi Arabia paying two dollars a liter for their petrol when they're a major oil exporter? That's what we do. Can you imagine Saudi Arabia building an import terminal to import oil because they're selling so much oil overseas and they've created a domestic shortage? That's what we do, and. The, the big counterpoint here is not just Western Australia, it's also the US. The US is now the biggest gas exporter in the world. We were the biggest. We're now number three. But the US also has ridiculously cheap domestic gas because they've got a reservation policy. So they've had the best of both worlds. We, on the other hand, don't have a reservation policy. And the hilarious thing is the US has actually reduced its carbon emissions, uh, per capita carbon emissions, by more than Australia because, they're all, because they've got this cheap gas, they've been able to shut down all the coal plants and they've basically just substituted out of coal into gas, which is a lower, lower emitter. And they've reduced their carbon emissions. Us, on the other hand, we've made gas super expensive. And now we're prolonging the life of our coal stations. So in New South Wales, I think it's, I think it's a year in power station. The government is now subsidizing Origin billions of dollars to keep that alive for longer because they've created a gas shortage, which Origin has helped create because get, Origin's part of the gas cartel, which is selling the stuff to China. You cannot make this stuff up. We are governed by morons. And if Albert Albo wants to make manufacturing competitive, fix the energy market. Don't do these stupid gimmicks and all this other stuff that's going to cost heaps of money. Fix the energy market. At least copy WA and even better, copy WA and copy Norway and uh, Qatar and create a some sort of super pro export tax or something so we can actually get some financial return because, you know, Qatar earned about $20 billion from their gas exports last year. Norway, about $40 billion. Norway's got a sovereign wealth fund worth 250000 US roughly per citizen. We have nothing to show for our gas boom. And as a result, we're incredibly reliant on personal income taxes because we don't tax our minerals properly. And then we are reliant on high immigration to bring in taxpayers because that's our main source of tax revenue instead of diversifying our tax revenue into our resources which would be the smart, smart thing to do. Um, so, you know, it's just dumb meets dumber in Australia. We stuff up everything. And the federal government, instead of addressing the source, it always does these side issues. So so you've got the source of the the rental crisis is obviously the mass immigration. But instead of addressing that, elbows come up with some lofty target, which will never be met as a distraction. Instead of fixing manufacturing by, by delivering cheap energy and also taking the heat out of inflation because energy is a key input, we've got this future manufacturing garbage boondoggle, which will just cost us billions of dollars. So it's look, it's all just, you know, gimmicks on top of gimmick, gimmicks, band-aids on top of band-aids. I hope I explained that properly. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit fired up tonight. I'm sorry, Martin. No, no, no. You're absolutely right to be. And uh, the point is that, um, you know, you, you, what, what you see is more silly decisions following silly decisions, right, to try and actually skirt around the real critical issues that should be tackled. And, you know, we've seen that in the housing sector over 20 to 30 years, and we've seen it more broadly in the energy sector as well. And, and the net result of all this, it's just worth, um, you know, re reflecting on this. The critical measure that I always look at is GDP per capita. In other words, yep. how much are we actually creating, uh, you know, as um, a, a, a per unit, as you like? And this is the uh, the, the latest chart, right, which <laughs> continues to show that GDP per capita continues to go negative and strongly negative. And that basically means that value is being destroyed in the economy on a per capita basis. Yeah, and, and, and they just paper over the cracks by... Um 
you know, by obviously bringing in huge numbers of people and that that gives you top line growth, but everyone's share it slice of the pie keeps shrinking. And that's the way, that's how they get away with it. It's one of the reasons why Treasury loves big migration. Loves it. Well, the federal government loves big migration. You know, it allows them to avoid a, a technical recession, even though they're all going backwards. And also the federal government collects 80% of tax revenue. So if you bring in a whole bunch of migrants, most of them work, they'll end up paying income tax. You'll get a bit more company tax as well because they'll spend it, you know, Harvey Norman, et cetera. And all that bounty goes to the federal government. Company tax, personal income tax goes to the federal government. The costs, though, fall on everyone else. So the costs fall mostly on the state governments because they're the ones who are responsible for service delivery. And it also falls on ordinary residents because the state governments then privatise everything because they need to money to somehow try and you know provide extra services and try and build more infrastructure, which they wouldn't need otherwise. And then you end up in a situation like Sydney's got where you're stuck with 20 toll roads or whatever it is. Um, whereas you, you know, 20 years ago, you had like two toll roads. You could drive around pretty much and avoid tolls most of the time. Now you can't drive anywhere without getting stunk. And, you know, this is the whole system we've got. The the federal government, unfortunately, loves it because they're, 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 they're incentivized to love immigration, high immigration, because they get the tax benefit and they get the top top line growth benefit so they can say that they're good economic managers when in fact they're not and we're going backwards yeah and unfortunately the seeds of you know bad past decisions whether they are done deliberately or whether they're done because of an ideological fixation you know i'm, I'm never quite sure i suspect a lot of it's ideologically driven thanks to treasury in particular uh, but what that means is that the intergenerational impacts are very profound, right? So the next generation will end up with significantly more debt, will end up living in an environment which is much, much worse than, than the current and past generations have. And the future prospects of Australia more broadly have to be under question because, of course, the other external factor is China and China is potentially uh, coming off the boil a little. So because of the narrow basis of our economy and because of the bad decisions that have been taken over many, many years, the future is not necessarily bright. No, it's not. And and unfortunately, though, you know, like um, I think about this all the time. So I've got, I've said it before, I've got a 16-year-old kid and a 13-year-old kid. And you know, I pretty much know that I'm going to have to help them into the housing market and the bank of money, mum and dad's going to have to have to happen. And unfortunately, we're in a situation now where, you know, it, it's become like a class system. So you're going to have to have wealthy parents to then do okay. And it used to be, it used to be, you know, go back 30 years or whatever it was, 40 years, and you could be pretty ordinary, just be an ordinary Joe, and you'd have a better life than your parents. And... Now you've got to be almost, a, even if you're a genius and, you know, you go and do a good course and you do everything and you do everything right, you're probably going to be less well off than your parents. And that's kind of the situation we've created here. It's ridiculous. It used to be you're almost guaranteed to be better off than your parents as long as you went and played dropkick. Um, and now, you know, you've got very little chance of being better off than your parents because of the system that we've got and the system that, we're, that, that you know, that we've created. So it's just, it, you know, it's a fast. Like I know my kids aren't going to have as good a, probably won't have as good a life as me uh, in terms of, you know, being out to own a detached house and all that sort of stuff. And in a lot of ways, mine's probably worse than my parents in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's just kind of every generation is sort of getting worse, uh, unfortunately, the system we've got. And, and that's really the wrong way around as far as I'm concerned. It shouldn't be that way, but that's kind of the, the system we've set up. Mm. Yeah, and partly it's um, short-termness from politicians who think about the election cycle. Partly it's an ideological view as to uh, let the markets, uh, you know, run roost over everything. Um, and uh, that means, of course, that the lobbying power of big business and corporations is very, very strong. And that means that sometimes things uh, don't work out well. And then, of course, we talked about migration. But to me, I think the energy crisis specifically with gas in Australia and the migration issue should be the two top factors that governments need to change policy on to be able to actually start moving in a different direction. If they don't do that, then the tax take will continue to stay extremely high. The amount of 
um, ability to be able to make you know new and better decisions for the future will be more and more limited, and that means that you've got this perpetual motion machine going in the wrong direction. Yeah, hundred percent. They, they they need to fix those two things, and uh, you know, I mean, there's obviously other stuff as well, but I, but but those are the two big picture things. Um, you know, again, Australia's an energy superpower. Like we we've got all the natural advantages in the world, and we've still managed to shoot ourselves in the foot. It's crazy, and you know, the ridiculous thing is because we're admittedly we don't collect enough bounty from it, but being one of the world's biggest minerals, you know. I have one of the world's biggest mineral endowments and mineral exporters. Running a high immigration policy actually works to our detriment because you dilute your mineral wealth over more people. Like, you know, a classic example is Norway's got about the uh, same population as Melbourne, roughly five and a half million, Melbourne and Geelong. And um, do you think they'd be better off if they had 10 million people? I don't think they would. They'd be diluting their sovereign wealth fund over, you know, roughly double the number of people. Um, so for them, their, their, their calculus is built in against high immigration. And as a result, they've only had a 25% population increase since about 1960 versus ours of 170%. And if we actually did tax our revenue uh, resource base properly, well, then, you know, it could actually kill big Australia immigration because suddenly it wouldn't be very smart. If you're collecting, you know, enough tax revenue from your mineral base, which is what we should, well, suddenly it doesn't make a lot of sense to keep adding, diluting that mineral base because then you dilute your mineral wealth per person. And, you know, if we did that, we could also reduce income taxes and we could have less brack creep and we could do it. We could pay for a whole bunch of stuff that we can't afford at the moment. Um, you know, like if I, I've often said if I was dictator for a day and then could do something which couldn't be undone, um, you know, I'd obviously fix the energy, I'd, I'd, I'd fix this sort of stuff, but I'd also get an expert, uh, commission some experts from Norway to come in and to, to advise their sovereign wealth fund to do the same for Australia uh, because it works. And I'll even get, you know, the same from Qatar. Like they, th those guys get tons of money from their gas exports, but we don't. Uh, like, you know, WA's got a half right in that the, they at least um, have domestic reservation. They do have some, you know, better mining royalties, obviously. But they still don't that, 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 you know, they don't get enough benefit for their citizens from it. They do a lot better than we do on the East Coast, but they still don't get enough. And on the East Coast here, we're just an absolute joke. Um, you know, we don't reserve it. We pay ridiculously high prices. And we just basically, you know, give it all to the robber barons. It's just crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, January will give you a week, Leaf. There you go. Yeah, a week, a year, whatever. <laughs> but, no, no, it, yeah, it, it'd only work if I could do it and then it can't be undone. But obviously, if I did do it, it'd just be undone straight away. So, you know, that's the, that, that's the system we've got. But the point is, there are alternative levers out there. So, you know, the, the, that's really, for me, the frustration of all of this. This is why we come back to politics, right? Because the politics of the situation is, unless you actually go in a different direction, you're going to do more of the same. You're going to perpetuate the, the, the same old, same old, right? And yet there are levers on the table that could be manipulated in a different way that would take us to a very different outcome. And that, and that for me, is, I guess, both the opportunity but also the frustration of the political political system and the way it works. Yeah, and, and the thing is, I think a lot of this stuff would actually be popular too. So, yep. I mean, obviously you're going to get the special pleading from the usual, you know, Minerals Council and all the usual players. But if you cut out that noise, like classic example is Queensland, right? So Queensland, uh, two years ago, they, they did a, and this is the way Australia should do it, like the federal government should do it. Queensland just dropped a massive increase in their uh, coal, coal, coal royalties charges, like a, basically a super profits type tax. Um, in the Queensland budget two years ago without it giving any consultation, giving any warning to the minerals industry. And it worked because they announced it on budget night. The, the, the lobbyists were like, what? I didn't see this coming. You didn't run this past me. And then they had to, then they're on the back foot and they had to lobby after the fact. And they weren't organised, et cetera. They couldn't run their campaigns or they ran them and it was too late. It was already done. It ended up being hugely successful, uh, popular, and it raised billions of extra dollars for Queensland. It still wasn't enough, but at least they did something. Why doesn't, you know, the federal government should do exactly the same thing. Like just drop it by stealth on budget night. Like don't tell anyone you're going to do it and just do it. And then catch the mining lobby on the back foot, 
suddenly tell everyone we're raising this much extra revenue and then give some tax cuts with it. For example, the sweeten the sweeten the pie um, for voters so they so they see an immediate benefit. And then you play voters against the rent seekers. So basically, you know, suddenly it'd be like they'll start the lobby. It's like, well, if we don't do this, we can't give you the tax cuts. And then people are like, well, I want my tax cut. You know, stuff like that. Like it's not that hard. But instead, they always give heaps of runway to the lobbyists to then shut it down, to run advertising campaigns, to gas to basically um, you know, white ant for a year. And then eventually the political pressure they cave in. They get into the opposition's ear. They, you know, promise them probably a gig after politics, et cetera. The corruption sets in and then, then it doesn't get done. So that's the way I do it. You just, you don't tell me you're going to do it. You just do it. And you, and you drop it, you drop a bomb. Like you, 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 it's like Survivor, Tribal Council. You've got to, you've got to stab them in the back when they don't see it. You don't do it. You don't, you don't go before, hey, I'm going to vote for you and you vote for me, whatever. Cause then you get voted out yourself, right? You got to be conniving. And you got to like be nice to the face. They don't expect it. They knife them in the back. <laughs> and that's what the federal government should do on this stuff. But, you know, they won't because they're cowards. They're bought. And, um, yeah, it's crazy. But I think this, I think all this stuff would be hugely popular in the electorate. Yeah, and well, Cameron Murray you know, talks about the game of mates, right? So, you know, that, that's really the point. But the point is that there is, there is an alternative path if – people actually could see it, which, you know, we've laid out and, um, you know, it, it, it's something to think about. Leith, we've come to the end of our time, amazingly. Um, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, just uh, if people want to find out more about you, where do they go? Okay, so number one, uh, yeah, my, my daily write-ins are obviously macrobusiness.com.au. Um, I seem to be on the media a lot these days doing interviews and that sort of stuff. But um, all those media uh, interviews get uploaded to my YouTube channel, which is at Leith Vo, L-E-I-T-H-V-O. I seem to be doing almost daily up, daily uploads now so because I do so many media interviews. But um, it's not like your content. It's just basically I do an interview, I record it, I put it up. But it seems to be quite popular. It's got I'm coming up to nearly 3,000 subscribers now and people seem to love it. So that's cool. Um, and also, if you're in Adelaide, uh, I'll be giving a presentation on uh, Saturday at from 2 p.m., um, I'll put up on macro business later in the week. I'm, I'm the keynote speaker for the Sustainable Population Australia Forum on Immigration and Housing, etc. So there's, there'll be three speakers on the keynote. Um, some of these charts, you notice that I've put in more effort than usual into this. Some of these are actually taken from that presentation. Um, so I'll be talking about a lot of this kind of stuff, but also other stuff. Uh, so I'll be doing that. Uh, that's I don't know, half an hour talk, 15 minutes Q&A. So if you want to meet me in the flesh and you live in Adelaide, uh, come along. Um, just Google Sustainable Population Australia and there'll be, there'll, be a, there'll be some info about that. So that's it. Uh, yeah, macrobusiness.com.au, at Leithfo on, on uh, YouTube if you want to check out my channel. And uh, if you're in Adelaide, come along Saturday and say good day and have some sandwiches. Terrific. Well, Leith, I want to say thank you very much. And, uh, you know, the, the COVID battle didn't uh, interfere in any way. So, so I really appreciate that. I'm, we'll... I'm drugged up. That's why. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> no, I've, I've, taken, I've taken a couple of cold and flu tablets, which is probably why I'm a bit animated. Well, no, it's good. I mean, it, I think the points you made were, were, were really clear. And, uh, you know, we'll have you back on um, down the track again because these are really, really important conversations. So, thank you very much. I'm going to take you off stream now and uh, I'll just uh, close the show, but look forward to catching up with you uh, again. And I hope you uh, get well very soon. Yeah, cheers. Thanks, to everyone. Speak to you later next time. Okay, bye. So, there you go, folks. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for all the super chats. I uh, really appreciate those and all the questions <coughs> and comments. And uh, just to say that next week, Adam Stokes is back. We're going to talk about some of the crypto stuff that's going on, of course, the halving for Bitcoin and uh, how that's playing into things. So, join me for that. And uh, just before I go, uh, let me just check where the dogs are. Oh, look, the dogs are back in their nice position, having had their lunch, having slept through most of the uh, most of the show so uh, there you go they're back <laughs> back in sleeping mode again i need to take them out for a walk a bit later anyway thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening really appreciate it and uh, check out the uh, recorded shows through the week we'll be back next tuesday and uh, thank you very much please share like and subscribe and i look forward to seeing you next time this is martin north from digital finance analytics signing off cheerio